Thank you for joining today's session. My name is Robin Gilbert and I'm the president of Fair Health. I am joined by two distinguished panelists, Dr. Ann Murphy and Dr. Todd Malfenter. In this program titled, How the Pandemic Has Altered the Telehealth Landscape for Mental Health Services, uh, we will discuss and explore how telehealth and more specifically telebehavioral health is impacting the patient and provider experience during the COVID-19 pandemic. If you have any questions while we are presenting, please note them in the Q&A box and we will address them near the end of the session. Next slide, please. Before we turn to specific data points pertaining to fair health usage in the Mid-Atlantic region, both generally and specifically to mental health, I thought it would be helpful to provide you with some background information about fair health and our data repository. For those less familiar with fair health, we are a national independent not-for-profit organization established to bring fairness and integrity to health insurance information. We were created out of a national hunger for a standardized, comprehensive, and trusted data source to help all stakeholders exhale and have confidence in the information presented. We meet that need by having the largest collection of private insurance claims in the country and by being proved stewards of that data. We now have over 32 billion private insurance claims from 2002 to the present, medical and dental procedures combined. We receive over 2 billion claims each year. The data are organized into 493 discrete geographic areas or geozips to help capture the relevant healthcare market. Such markets tend to track with the first three digits of a zip code. The data are presented voluntarily, typically monthly, from approximately 60 national and regional payers and third-party administrators and reflect both self-insured and fully insured covered lives. Apart from our commercial data collection, we were certified by CMS as a national qualified entity and thus entrusted with the entire collection of parts A, B, and D of the Medicare data set for all 50 states dating back to 2013. Currently, that accounts for approximately 36 billion Medicare claims. It should be noted that Medicare Advantage are housed separately with our commercial claims collection. Next slide, please. Because of the breadth of our data collection, coupled with our independence, many federal agencies and officials have reached out to Fair Health for assistance with various programs and initiatives. For example, we provide data to the Bureau of Labor Statistics to assist with their development of monthly medical indices. We also have served as the primary source for GAO reports on ambulance and dental services. We serve as an approved source for MedPAC reports to Congress, demonstrating variation between the Medicare and commercial programs. We have provided data to various agencies on topics ranging from Lyme and other tick-borne diseases to food allergies and the opioid epidemic. And we likewise have been turned to a trusted source for telehealth data by the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth within the Health Resources and Services Administration. Next slide, please. States similarly turn to Fair Health to address their health-related initiatives. For example, we serve as the official data source for many workers' comp fee schedules, surprise billing uh, programs, dispute resolution programs, and fee schedules for state government employees, among other state health-related programs. And in addition, states turn to Fair Health to get the benefit of analytics regarding their state's healthcare profile and even more, they can evaluate their states against other neighboring states or like states, since we are more like a national quasi all payer claims database. Okay, so now let's turn our attention to telehealth data in the Mid-Atlantic region. As mentioned, first I'll talk about telehealth generally, and then we'll move on to telehealth in the mental health space specifically. Next slide, please. As you can see in these charts, there has been a notable increase in telehealth utilization in Delaware, Maryland, and DC since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. During 2019, telehealth utilization in these areas was less, less than 0.1% of all medical claim lines. Beginning in March of 2020, however, telehealth was between 6.3% and 18.8% of all medical claim lines for this area grouping in the aggregate. Telehealth utilization was slightly lower in rural areas, comprising 15.8% of all medical claim lines at its peak. Next slide, please. 
Interestingly, Kentucky and West Virginia experienced lower utilization rates compared to Delaware, Maryland, and DC. In April 2020, when telehealth utilization was at its peak, it only reached 9.7% of all medical claim lines in this area. Telehealth use has stayed relatively stable in these states since May, making up 2.5% to 3% of all medical claim lines. Also, it should be noted that in May, rural areas within these states had a higher utilization rate than in the urban areas. That month, 4.6% of medical services were delivered via telehealth in rural areas, 2.7% in urban areas. Next slide, please. Telehealth utilization in Pennsylvania and New Jersey is similar to that in Delaware, Maryland, and DC. Overall, urban telehealth claim lines reached a height of 17.6% of all medical claim lines in April 2020. However, we can see a much larger lag rurally, even at the height of the pandemic. In rural areas of New Jersey and Pennsylvania, telehealth services at that time only comprised 8% of all medical services. Next slide, please. As we can see in this slide, North Carolina and Virginia experience lower telehealth utilization rates than some of the other area groupings in the Mid-Atlantic region. Telehealth utilization was at its highest in April 2020, when 9.8% of all medical services in urban areas and 7.6% in all rural areas were delivered via telemedicine. Notably in July, Telehealth utilization as a percent of all medical claim lines dropped to 1.4% in rural areas and 4.8% in urban areas. In October, however, we could see that telehealth utilization rose again in rural areas, with telehealth services making up 3.1% of all medical claim lines compared to 4.5% of urban areas. Next slide, please. The age cohorts using telehealth services remain fairly consistent throughout Delaware, Maryland, DC, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Telehealth services were most commonly performed among the 21 to 65 year old age group. Next slide, please. Here we see that the age groups utilizing telehealth services in North Carolina and Virginia are similar to those in other states, while Kentucky and West Virginia differ slightly. North Carolina and Virginia see the bulk of utilization in the 21 to 50 year old age range with nearly 22% of utilization occurring in the zero to 20 and 51 to 65 age groups. Kentucky and West Virginia, however, see 18% telehealth utilization among the zero to 20 year old cohort and only about 21% utilization among the 21 to 35 year old age group. There is also a marked difference in utilization among those 65 and older in Kentucky and West Virginia. The age range comprised 12.8% of telehealth claim lines, which is noticeably higher than other states in the region. Next slide, please. All states in the Mid-Atlantic region see a similar gender distribution with 60 to 63% of all telehealth utilization attributed to female patients. Next slide, please. As you may know, many codes that are built in an in-person setting can also be built in a telehealth setting. We thought it might be helpful to show some comparisons between billed charges for the same service in an office setting versus a telehealth venue. Here we are looking at CPT code 90834, which is a 45 minute psychotherapy code. 90834 was one of the top built codes in a telehealth setting in 2020. Charges for these codes, whether performed in person or via telehealth, are fairly similar in the state of North Carolina. The average amount billed for this code in a telehealth setting is $133 compared to $136 for an in-office setting. Next slide, please. We see a similar comparison in West Virginia for CPT code 99213, which is a 15 minute office visit. This code has a median billed value of $122 when performed via telehealth compared to $125 when performed in an in-office setting. Next slide, please. 
Here, we've used the same colors for identical codes to allow you to see how the various geographic areas compare with respect to the most common procedures build. When a field is white, it means that there is no match for that code in another area. The top telehealth procedure codes built in 2020 are the same across all of the states in the Mid-Atlantic region, excluding Kentucky and West Virginia. We see that the services most frequently conducted via telehealth in Delaware, Maryland, DC, North Carolina, Virginia, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania are a 15 minute office visit, a 25 minute office visit, a 45 minute psychotherapy visit, a 60 minute psychotherapy visit, and a physician telephone service between 11 and 20 minutes. Comparatively, the 45 minute psychotherapy visit was not included in the top five telehealth procedure codes in Kentucky and West Virginia. Instead, we see a five to 10 minute physician telephone service appearing in their top five codes. Next slide, please. Notably, the top telehealth diagnoses vary throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. All four state groupings have mental health conditions as the top telehealth diagnosis, making up over 35% of all services in these states. In New Jersey, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Virginia, developmental disorders were the second most common reason for a telehealth visit. This diagnosis did not appear among the top five for the other two state groupings. Diabetes and hypertension, however, appeared among the top five diagnoses for Delaware, Maryland, DC, Kentucky, and West Virginia. Kentucky and West Virginia were the only states that did not have exposure to communicable diseases among the top five telehealth diagnoses in 2020. Next slide, please. Now let's look more specifically at mental health services performed in a telehealth capacity. In 2020, almost 30% of the mental health diagnoses in the Mid-Atlantic region were generalized anxiety disorder. Following closely behind are major depressive disorder and adjustment disorders, which respectively made up 22 and 21% of all mental health telehealth claim lines. Next slide, please. As you may know, we have reported on some concerning mental health trends among the pediatric population throughout the pandemic. Mental health claim lines in the Mid-Atlantic region for patients 13 to 18 years old have been much higher in 2020 compared to 2019. At the height of the pandemic in April, mental health claim lines as a percent of all medical claim lines were 115% greater compared to the same month in 2019. At the same time, the number of medical claim lines decreased 55%. For the rest of 2020, mental health claim lines maintained a higher percentage of all medical claim lines compared to 2019. Next slide, please. In the Mid-Atlantic region, approximately 27.3% of mental health services delivered via telehealth were provided to pediatric patients between zero and 22 years old. Patients between 23 and 35 years of age had a similar level of utilization at 27.2%, followed by those aged 36 to 60 with 24.8%. Next slide, please. For patients age 13 to 18, we see a seismic shift in the number of mental health services being performed in a telehealth setting during the pandemic. In January, less than 1% of mental health services were provided in a telehealth setting. However, by March, it was roughly equitable with nearly 50% of mental health treatment being conducted in an office setting and 50% in a telehealth setting. And in the following months, we saw telehealth continuing to materially outdistance in office settings for mental health services. Next slide, please. We see a similar pattern for college age patients. In January and February, there was minimal use of telehealth for mental health services. In January, less than 1%, and in February, roughly 3% of mental health services were rendered virtually. However, by April, the share of mental health services provided via telehealth had increased to 71%. Through November, those disproportionate levels in favor of telehealth persisted, never dipping below 59%. Next slide, please. So I wanna thank you uh, for your attention now, but I love, I'm excited to pass the baton right now to Dr. Ann Murphy, 
who will share some of her incredibly interesting findings. Dr. Murphy is an associate professor and director of the Northeast and Caribbean Mental Health Technology Transfer Center in the Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions at Rutgers, the School of Health Professions. You can learn more about her uh, biography on the virtual platform. Anne, it's all yours. Thank you, Robin, and thanks to all of you who are here with us today. Uh, thanks so much. Um, I'm happy to be here with you today. I'm just going to take a moment and um, do a brief introduction to the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center to make sure that folks here with us today are familiar with it. Um, both Todd Molfenter, who will speak um, in just a moment, and I represent um, two of the regional mental health technology transfer centers. I'm with the Northeast and Caribbean, which provides training and technical assistance uh, support to folks in the New Jersey, New York, uh, Puerto Rico, and US Virgin Islands. And our charge, we're funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, to enhance the capacity of the behavioral health workforce, as well as other related workforces to help them be able to deliver evidence-based and promising practices to individuals living with mental health conditions. Um, the uh, services that we support through our training and technical assistance span the full range of mental health services from prevention to treatment to recovery supports. And we also have received additional supplemental funding to support student mental health through training and technical assistance with K through 12 schools, uh, educators and staff. And more recently, we've also been provided some additional funding to support provider well-being, particularly for mental health and other health care providers. Next slide. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic significantly impacted the delivery of behavioral health services. Um, the behavioral health organizations had to rapidly modify their service delivery structure, uh, moving primarily from in-person services, as Robin just outlined, um, to remote telehealth delivery. This was and continues to be especially important because many of the individuals who participate in behavioral health services, particularly those with serious mental illnesses and substance use disorders, have elevated infection rates generally and poorer prognoses if infected with COVID-19. Uh, it's speculated that this can be due to their higher rates of smoking and vaping, substance use, medical comorbidities, increased susceptibility to infections, instability in their housing, and in fact, homelessness, and limited social networks, as well as reduced access to medical care. Early on, this was just speculated, but um, more recently, you may have seen that research has been published that shows, for example, that a diagnosis of schizophrenia spectrum um, disorders puts someone at 2.7 times the odds of dying from COVID-19, which is second only to age. So delivering services in a safe and ethical way uh, was and continues to be critically important for this particular population. Next slide. We also know that the stressors associated with the pandemic, including staying at home, uh, being isolated, reduced access to recovery supports and traditional treatment can and have increased the rates of symptom exacerbation in mental illness and substance use relapse. The Northeast and Caribbean MHTTC, the center that I direct, wanted to understand what was happening for the behavioral health providers and organizations who were responding to these challenging circumstances. Um, we administered a survey to providers and provider organizations mm -hmm. throughout New York and Puerto Rico, two parts of our region, to try to um, collect information that would help us to be able to better support them in terms of training and technical assistance needs. Next slide. So what I'm gonna talk about now is sort of looking at the flip side of some of what Robin presented from the numbers perspective. Um, what we were able to do is collect some qualitative data to look at um, these experiences from the provider side. So the surveys that we distributed um, 
went out to uh, folks in New York first, and we re received responses from them between the beginning of April to the beginning of May, and were distributed in Puerto Rico following that, uh, and we received uh, responses from individuals in Puerto Rico throughout June of 2020. So they capture slightly different time periods in the, um, in the pandemic. Both surveys were distributed through our center's email distribution list, as well as by the SAMHSA regional administrator to, um, to that organization's contact list. And in New York, we also got the buy-in from the New York Office of Mental Health, and they distributed it to their contacts. The survey utilized exploratory open-ended questions to assess the challenges and adaptations related to delivering services during the pandemic. Participants had the uh, ability to report up to five challenges that they experienced and uh, adaptations related to those challenges. We analyzed the data using a qualitative content analysis approach in which the data was conceptually coded and then clustered by category and then finally by overarching theme. We did this in a, a team coding approach um, in which any disagreements around coding were discussed until consensus was reached. We received uh, 122 completed surveys from Puerto Rico, which represented 80 different organizations, and 259 completed surveys from New York, which represented 238 uh, separate organizations. As you can see on the slide, um, the roles of the survey respondents uh, differed significantly by location. In Puerto Rico, the surveys were overwhelmingly completed by individuals providing direct services. So people in titles like social worker, psychologist, psychiatrist, and physician. Whereas in New York, the surveys were mostly filled out by higher level administrators and supervisors or directors. A wide variety of service types were represented, including outpatient mental health counseling and psychotherapy services, as well as community mental health programs, children's mental health services, as well as a few uh, substance use treatment and prevention programs. I should note um, that the survey data that was collected from Puerto Rico was collected in Spanish, the survey was in Spanish, the data was collected in Spanish and was then translated to English for data analysis purposes. Um, and a Spanish speaker was involved in the data analysis as well. Uh, next slide. So after coding the data, um, there were 10 overarching themes that came out of the New York data related to challenges and seven from the Puerto Rico data. In New York, out of the 10 challenges identified, technology ranked as the eighth highest challenge, again, out of 10 in terms of numbers of responses, and telehealth ranked as third. Um, those were behind business operations, which was the first challenge, and service provision, which was the second. In Puerto Rico, out of the seven challenges, telehealth was tied for second, uh, most mentioned challenge behind service provision and tied with client challenges. So it was very clear that um, in this rapid transition that both technology and telehealth uh, serve to be challenging for the organizations um, utilizing it. Next slide, please. Just to provide a little more detail about those challenges um, in New York, the, uh, in the New York data, the responses associated with the technology challenges, again, this was eighth in, in terms of uh, ranking, uh, included things like lack of access to secure HIPAA compliant platforms and an inability to access electronic medical records remotely. Specific problems included creating forms that could be signed electronically by clients that were legally binding. Um, so things like consents for treatment and medication. Additionally, there was an overall lack of adequate and up-to-date technology offered to staff. So that included things like computers, cameras, um, webcams, that is, business-provided cell phones, printers, scanners, et cetera. 
as well as limited IT support to set up equipment for remote work and to troubleshoot, troubleshoot technology issues. So most of these organizations didn't really have a robust um, IT department um, and weren't able to address the needs of the staff members who had transitioned to both working from home and working via telehealth. Next slide. In terms of the telehealth challenges identified in New York, the greatest number of responses related to client access and use of telehealth. Uh, clients didn't have or had limited access to technology and reliable internet services. They experienced difficulty utilizing technology to engage in services when access was available. Many services had to be provided by phone because clients didn't have access to computers. Uh, there were reports that clients felt then overburdened by multiple calls from their providers checking in with them. And additionally, clients ran into challenges of having limited cell phone plans, uh, which curtailed their communication with providers due to um, inadequate minutes. This was particularly a challenge for individuals re uh, receiving um, community mental health services who had uh, cell phones that were provided by um, some of the federal programs that, um, that support that. For those who were able to engage in telehealth services, there were still some challenges, particularly related to maintaining focus and engagement for the entirety of the session. Um, and from the staff perspective, staff found providing services via telehealth difficult. They highlighted their general lack of experience using both computers and telephone to provide these services, as well as the rapid transition. This required staff to learn very quickly and under less than ideal circumstances to use the technology and to adapt what they were doing in person to um, telehealth. Uh, just a, an interesting point, I think, that, that most providers were trying to find a parallel to what they did in person via telehealth, as opposed to some of the research which has focused on specific telehealth um, designed interventions. Um, some survey respondents also raised concerns that not all services were provided with the same consistent level of quality when using the telehealth format, and also noted that, quote, something was lost by not being able to share the same physical space. Um, with the person they were working with. Um, there were are also some initial challenges, although most of this seems to have gotten worked out, around billing for remote services and some lack of clarity around the relaxation of telehealth requirements. Um, so remember that th this data was collected in April, so um, very early on in the pandemic. Uh, next slide. In Puerto Rico, respondents identified uh, several challenges related to telehealth. The most reported issues were lack of technology or access to technology, similar to New York, lack of skills or knowledge to use the technology, and lack of internet service or poor connectivity. Um, some additional things were on the client side, a lack of comfort and familiarity with using telehealth, um, some lack of trust uh, or not being open to using telehealth, as well as concerns about the impact on the quality of services, some privacy concerns for on the client side for um, people who were using telehealth in their home and may not feel comfortable talking um, with others around. Um, also staff not being prepared and needing additional training. In Puerto Rico, they also had concerns about the lower reimbursement rates for telehealth services. Next slide. Um, on the positive side, so those were the challenges, but we also asked folks to identify adaptations that they had made to address the challenges presented by the pandemic. And not surprisingly, telehealth was the number one adaptation in both New York and Puerto Rico that people reported in response to the challenges they were experienced, uh, experiencing. Um, in New York, they also identified technology as another significant adaptation. Next slide. So just to share a little more detail of that, in New York, telehealth and the transition from in-person services um, 
was the primary adaptation. As I mentioned, many organizations provided all contact with staff and patients virtually, including the use of telephone, text messages, and emails. Um, they, they noted using new strategies to engage with clients, making efforts to have more frequent virtual contacts, providing more reminders of services, um, using video and audio calls, as well as web conferencing. There was also an effort to adapt the programming to be more appealing to clients by offering things like virtual games or feeling assessments, as well as providing some client education. Next slide. In New York, they did some, made some adaptations around technology, provide, pr primarily around agencies investing financially in um, acquiring more technology, both for their staff and in some cases, providing um, technology and purchase devices to the clients as well. Again, there were also some adaptations around providing additional training. Next slide. In Puerto Rico, um, the uh, adaptations were, again, primarily around telehealth. There was mixed use of video conferencing and telephone calls, education to clients on how to use telehealth to increase their comfort, as well as some unique strategies to engage. Next slide. So just briefly, a couple takeaways from our um, survey findings. One of the key takeaways that stood out from all of these surveys was the very clear digital divide that exists among some of the individuals and in some locations. This is still the case for people with lower socioeconomic resources, individuals with disabilities, those who live in rural areas and in the US territories. The pandemic has really underscored this and introduced it as another potential um, consideration in the social determinants of health. Next slide. One of the other things that came up um, that's related to telehealth was the significant distress that the staff were experiencing. While this also is largely related to the pandemic and things that may be unique to the pandemic, some of what we heard in these surveys were also challenges related to working remotely and feeling more disconnected from their peers. Next slide. So while it's likely that telebehavioral health will <laughs> remain um, and that this will be our probably our new normal, um, Todd will tell us more about this, about how programs anticipate using telehealth going forward. Um, we want to acknowledge both the benefits that telehealth brings, but also uh, the importance of considering accessibility, equity, and quality as we go forward. Next slide. Uh, I just want to let people know we were able at this point to publish um, the findings of the challenges from the New York surveys, if anyone is interested. And we are currently working on um, two additional uh, manuscripts on the adaptations and the challenges and adaptations from Puerto Rico. Next slide. So this is just a way to keep in touch with us if you're interested. And I think that wraps up. I think I have a contact slide, but then I'm all done. Thank you, Anne. Um, that was really interesting. And now let's pass the baton to Dr. Todd Mulfenter, who will present his telebehavioral health survey findings, which are also fascinating. He's a senior scientist at the Center for Health and Enhancement Systems Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a faculty member of the University of Wisconsin-Madison College of Engineering. You can learn more about Todd as well on the virtual platform. Uh, it's all yours, Todd. Yeah, thank you, Robin. Thank, thank you, Ann, too. Good, two really good presentations that, that sets up this piece well. And uh, what I'm going to talk about over the next 15 minutes or so is just uh, how how people are are you were using telehealth during the the time period of last summer, and and then sort of looking into 
you know, how, how this will be used as, as it's progressing into the future. Uh, I am, I am with one of the, the regional uh, centers that, that uh, Ann talked about. Uh, I'm with the uh, Great Lakes or Region 5 Addiction Mental Health Prevention Technology Transfer Centers, which represents the, the states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So what we what we did is is last you know starting in last fall we we became very interested in in how this major shift to telehealth was occurring, and and even more interested in you know what's its likelihood of being um, sustained over time and uh, and 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 how it will be sustained and and what people like about it and don't like about it. I think you you can see from really from from Robin and Ann's data both that that there was a, a really large shift um, to telehealth. Uh, I, I find it interesting from Robin's data that 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 shift uh, uh, seemed to be much higher uh, for mental health and uh, than than regular medical services. And so with with that shift that occurred, you know. Um, what were people sort of you know using you know using telehealth for, and uh, and and then how how do we project they'll use it in the future? We we sent out a survey uh, last it started last May and went through August and uh, who we had help us with the survey were were these different um, uh, regional centers and uh, Anne's as as she mentioned was was uh, one of them. Um, next slide, please. And and as I, as I mentioned, that the survey purpose is is how was how is uh, virtual services being used in mental health, and then um, what you know where do we see it being applied and how into the future. Next slide, please. So for this survey, we, we had uh, 327 organizations that participated in the survey. Uh, next slide, please. And, um, and, it, and it include uh, 38 states. Uh, with with the, sort of some of the, the, the dimensions of people who participated, you can see on, on the left hand, uh, left hand margin is just the number of organizations. You can see there was a, a mix of rural, small cities, suburban and urban. Next slide, please. There was also uh, uh, some little less of a mix across organization ownership. You can see the the survey was was primarily specialty treatment providers, whether they were in standalone locations or multiple locations. Although we we did have you know over fifty um, survey responses uh, from health systems, and we had had uh, about thirteen from FQHCs. Uh, next slide, please. And then within the organization, we had different people who would fill the survey out. Uh, we, and, and it was uh, sort of a, an even split over and all between administrators and counselors. And, and what we did with all these, like whether it was location or whether it was organization type or organization role, is we did an analysis to see if there was differences in either how, how the organizations were using telehealth and their likelihood to continue using it uh, post pandemic. And, uh, and we found no differences. I mean, I think uh, our, our initial thought was, you know, uh, rural might be more interested than urban, you know, and you can see from Robin's data, actually urban was quite interested in it too. And, and you start to see some, maybe some digital divide kind of issues. And then we were wondering if administrators would be more interested in it than counselors or vice versa. And we found really no differences in, in how people were either interested in it now or into the future, which, which we thought was uh, interesting itself. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the, the, the current use of telehealth by service. And uh, telehealth is, is what you have here is the, is the reddish bars or telephone, uh, the greenish bars are video. And, and just, 
you know, the, the writing on the, on the bottom here is, 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 is fairly small, but it's a screening and assessment, individual therapy, group therapy, medical management, case management, multidisciplinary team-based assertive community treatment, psychoeducation, peer support. What you can see is individual type services like screening, individual therapy, uh, case management, uh, psychoeducation even, are the ones that were used more, more prominently or, or they had the service available. Um, group therapy, medical management, um, ACT, not as much. And, and so, so you can see there was sort of um, an affinity to individual services versus group services to be used by telehealth. Uh, next slide, please. The next thing we ask is, is um, and the last slide was in percentages. These are just actual numbers. We ask, you know, their, their, how much they anticipate using, and we looked at telephone and video, and we, look, and we ask them how, how much they anticipate using telephone for the following services. And the red bars are, you know, they anticipate using it less. In other words, we've tried tele <laughs> telephone and we sort of don't like it or about the same, you know. And so there's, there's really no, no general increase that's going to occur. And then the green bars are, you know, it, you know we, we're going to use this a little or much more. In other words, we, we sort of like this and, and we hope it, it continues. And, um, and you can see where there's the bigger gaps for telephone is again with some of these individual services, individual therapy, case management, screening and assessment. And, um, and the gap isn't quite as, as, as big, you know, for these uh, group services. And, and with this, this is for telephone. We're about to go to video. Look at the, the gaps between the bars here. You know, they're, they're, they're the definitely using more is more prevalent, but but the gaps between the bars isn't uh, isn't um, quite as large as you'll see in the next slide, or as close to being as large. Next slide, please. And so this is video, and and you can see, and, and what we saw in these surveys um, for mental health professionals is the use of video uh, was was more preferred than the view the the use of telephone. And, and we did the same survey with addiction services where that gap wasn't quite as big because I think in addiction, there, there's less, uh, less access to the technology, which, which I think really plays into here. I think, I think as, as, as we learn from our data, that if you, you give professionals a choice between video and, um, and telephone, they're gonna take video. And then, um, and then if you ask patients the, the difference between the two, um, I, I think they mostly prefer video unless they're having either access or usability issues with the technology that, that Ann mentioned earlier. You know, in other words, they, they don't have a smartphone or they don't have a tablet or a computer to use to be able to do a Zoom or a meeting like this with their with their therapist or psychiatrist, and and then and then the, the the phone becomes you know more preferred at that time based on you know based on that need. Next slide, please. So you know the the top three you know based on this you know odds ratio of you know using less or more compared to the same or less individual therapy fourteen times, and it shows you. <coughs> This is something that we, we sort of, you, you, you saw it some in, in Anne's qualitative analysis, and we saw it a lot in the quantitative data is people really seem to like individual therapy, particularly by video. Um, and, and again, these were providers answering these questions. We, we didn't ask the, 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 the patients at all. So in any patient data we had, which we'll talk about here in, a, in just a little bit, um, you know, is, is more through the eyes of the providers versus patients themselves. But the other two is psychoeducation and screening and assessment. You can see the individual therapy is sort of the clear, you know, we really want to keep doing this over time. And then even the odds ratios of, you know, eight and seven are, are still pretty, pretty strong. 
and uh, and shows you their interest. Things people weren't as interested in. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and and again, we sort of have the video and phone. So so for group therapy do, by phone, people didn't quite like it. Medication management. Um, I think just to be able to see people and hear what's going on, do pill counts if needed, things like that, you know, and, and group therapy was even for an odds ratio was even, you know, the people preferred against it since it's below one and medication management, ACT, actually, you know, for odds ratios, those aren't too bad, but those were the lowest three. And so it shows you how overall there was a, a general acceptance of of the new technology which sort of differs a little bit i mean from you know what ann was mentioning in that you know people are really struggling with it to begin with and then we we see as the summer came on and people got used to it there's you know th there was a a fair amount of acceptance to it and and we're, we're finding some interesting anecdotal situations as as we're sort of getting high numbers vaccinated, we have a whole group that are sort of, you know, struggling with going back, so to speak, to, to in person. So next slide, please. So also what we looked at in this, in this analysis is different organizational factors that seem to be, seem to direct whether or not the organization liked virtual or didn't like virtual and the individual and and things that really seem to correlate with how the individual and the organization felt about the technology were were a variety of things um and and i'm sort of it, it, one is leadership is you know is the leadership supportive of it do they feel like it's it's good you know, it's good. It's not just good clinical, but good business too. That was one. A clinical champion, um, particularly, um, particularly with the, the clinical champions, really, really preferred um, video. And uh, and if there was a clinical, particularly a physician champion, that that really made a difference for or against it. Um, staff factors. It, it seems like how staff were feeling about it, sort of weighed in how the organization felt about it overall. I think you you saw some of that in, in Ann's comments too, where some of the staff were struggling with it. Some of the staff had to be given new technology, things like that. Patient factors, how they felt about it and how people were like, particularly organizations that said, hey, we only are doing televideo. And then you have a whole group of patients that are like, uh, we can't do that. You know, and, and then that sort of creates some feelings against it. And then you have a whole nother group of patients that are like, hey, this is actually pretty convenient. You know, I used to have to get babysitters to come into my therapy and now I can just do it from home, you know, and, and things like that. And then last and, and a very strong piece in all this and a piece we all need to think about as this is progressing forward is financial considerations. You know, rules for reimbursing for telehealth were relaxed and uh, for for the pandemic. And um, and and we saw a lot of written comments around, you know, hey, we really wanna keep doing this, but if the reimbursement starts shifting in a way where you, you can't do it or you get reimbursed less than in person, you know, that, that really changes things here. And so, so I, I think, you know, each of us sort of have a have a responsibility to communicate that to, to people that are sort of thinking through future policy is is the importance of of uh, reimbursement for this. Next slide, please. Okay, so and just to break it into the technologies a little bit, why phone? Um, when people preferred phone, they liked the affordability of it. They like the ease of use of it. Phones are just easier. You don't have to worry about internet connection and, and things like that. And next slide, please. Why video? Um, leadership, particularly in mental health, likes it, likes it a lot, and as well as clinical clinicians and staff. Uh, they just, you know, you just got the overall feeling like when we can talk to someone, we can see them. It, it feels a lot better to us than than by phone. 
And, um, and, and then I think, you know, there's a concession, of course, it's like if phone's the only way to do it, we'd prefer to do that than certainly. But if we have a choice between phone and video, we really like video. And they sort of felt overall that reimbursement was gonna be more likely um, for video. And, and that sort of was a, a consideration and in, in how much they thought they'd be using it in the future. Next slide, please. Will these results stick? One thing we, we did look at, it, and we've sort of done quite a bit of research around technology adoption and um, technology sustainability at our, at our center. And what we found is, is really two things really can predict if technology will be sustained in its use. Um, one is, is, you know, is it easy to use? And the other is, does it add value? And so as we go to wrap up here, uh, a couple, just a, a few, a couple slides to, to sort of show you that really with uh, telebehavioral health, uh, it was both. Uh, next slide, please. You know, you can see here where we'd ask people on a one to five Likert scale is, um, do they perceive these technologies, telephone and phone, uh, easy to use, you know, find, find it easy to get into, offering our patients does not require a lot of effort, and, and really ease of use. Uh, anything above a three is considered good. And, uh, and you can see, you know, it's for both of these, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good. Um, you know, I think that the lowest one was probably video. We're re offering our patients this does not require a lot of extra, extra effort. I think, you know, particularly in the early days, there was a lot of sort of, you know, uh, clinicians figuring out how to use technology. Next slide, please. And then perceive usefulness and value. You can see these numbers are even higher. You know, it, it enhances our effectiveness, improves our performance, improves our productivity, is useful. All these are in the, you know, 3.5 or higher and even above four as far as, you know, video base being useful. And so, and you, you I mean, these, seeing these kind of numbers around an adoptive technology is, is not certainly not always the case. And, and so it really, it shows you that there's, there's a, you know, at least last summer, we're continuing to see it. There, there's a lot of goodwill um, from, from uh, you know, as far as wanting to use, use uh, you know, telebehavior health into the future. Next slide, please. So final impressions around this. Um, I think, first of all, I mentioned the reimbursement issue. It's, it's really important. It, it, it's going to be important. Um, telehealth, I think as you look at it, you know, you got to be careful not to think of it as far as these last two bullets as sort of a, a yes or a no. You know, there's certain services, there's certain patient populations where, where telehealth works better with. And then, and so with that in mind, you know, I think where we're seeing a, a lot of organizations going to, we're encouraging them to do that. We're actually starting to work with some on, on how to best do that is a hybrid approach, you know, where certain services are going to be, you know, provided by telebehavioral health and others um, not as much. And most importantly, the patients will, will get, you know, being able to give the, the patients sort of a choice of, of what they prefer. So that wraps up my presentation and I believe we're gonna, we're gonna move on to questions at this point. Thank you, Todd, and, and thank you, Anne. And before we turn to the audience's questions, I just wanted to pose to each of you the question of what you perhaps found most surprising from the results in your survey or really what stood out to you you know, one or two sort of salient points if you want to highlight, and then we can turn to the audience questions. Anne, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, what I found most, well, this isn't, I guess this is related to telehealth, and I see there's a question about it, so I'm going to highlight it because this is truly what stood out to me most in the survey results was really um, the impact on, the impact of the pandemic on providers. Um, so, um, you know, New York was, was particularly hard hit, especially early on. And, um, and the, a lot of the responses talked about the loss of 
coworkers and clients and their services um, and those kinds of things. So I think that was really just stood out very significantly to me how much that was impacting people. And I think the connection to telehealth is really just that as telehealth allows us to do things more remotely, that we do need to really be very mindful and pay a lot of attention uh, uh, to how we're shifting our supervision practices, how we're shifting our sort of organizational connection and wellness um, and uh, and how to do that well so that people can continue to be supported both in the context of the pandemic and going forward. Todd, same to you, anything that really stood out or surprised you about your results? Yeah, I, oh boy, there, there was so, so many things actually. We, I mean, we, first of all, I mean, we, we did a, a similar survey back in 2015, just to sort of get, uh, and, and with, it was primarily addiction providers, but still, you know, I think you, you, we, we sort of see some similarities across behavioral health, addiction, mental health. And there was this very little use as Robin, as your data showed very little use and, and, and sort of a bit of, you know, frankly, a, a, there, there was some folks that are like, hey, technology is the future. You know, we should be doing more of this. But there was just a lot of reticence mm -hmm. of, you know, hey, you know, this isn't as good as in person. And, you know, hey, this doesn't work with our workflows nearly as well. And, and so just first of all, to see that and, and we would see sort of use rates like you had in your data, Robin, that were, you know, pretty low and then mm -hmm. seeing jump. That's the first item. Mm -hmm. The second is, is, you know, the last time we saw um, a technology that was really, I would call it almost f forced on people, you know, um, you know, whether you want to call it disruptive technology or just, or, or what have you, where, where just a large group sort of were set, you know, told, hey, you really need to be using this as electronic health records. Mm -hmm. And in the, the, um, the acceptance rate um, with electronic health records was not nearly as high as the data we're, we're seeing here. And, and so I think, you know, that was, you know, I, I and we just, this uh, honestly, when we put this out, that's why we did it. We just didn't know what we'd see. And, and to see the general acceptance as high as it was, was good. And then also to, for some reason, and, and you, you think, uh, you, know, you think I would have thought differently is, is, is it would, just the trends would have been general across services. And truly there seems to be some services where they're like, yeah, this is actually really helpful. And mm -hmm. others they are like, mm, this is, you know, we can, we can sort of do some things in groups and have breakout rooms and stuff like that and get better at it. But boy, it just, it, um, you know, it just doesn't seem to work out as well for, for most of the providers. Right. All right. Well, I want to turn, I think you may touch on it a little bit, Anne, but the question about did any of the organizations find solutions for the workforce issues of feeling disconnected? Um, any tips for other organizations or ways in which they're trying to remediate that that feeling? Yeah, well, I, I'd love to hear from Todd on this, too. So I think in terms of the data, we don't have that because um, this was, you know, kind of in the thick of it. And mm -hmm. I think organizations were really only able to turn to this kind of after um, things started to settle down at least a, a little bit. Um, what I will say is that um, you know, what I've heard and what we as a center have been doing some work or, uh, in supporting is sort of intentional connection activities. I think, um, you know, the reports have come out that people are working more, you know, the average work week has gone up, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing about working from home is you lose a lot of the informal connection and discussion that happens naturally in a physical environment. So I think building in intentional activities that are just about connection and support and fun um, instead of every meeting just being, you know, business um, all the time. I think those are some things right. that we're starting to see. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is really organizations looking at organization wide wellness approaches and mm. strategies. Um, we are doing some work around this, trying to build in um, 
kind of resilience approaches. Um, so we have worked with uh, one organization and we're actually, if anyone from the Northeast or Caribbean is on, we're actually recruiting organizations to participate in, um, in a resilience building um, program where we've worked with administrators and supervisors to um, build their own resilience, but also to look at their policies and procedures and their meeting schedules. This is one of the things we've heard most about is that there's so many meetings and it's really hard for people. So one of the things this organization did was look critically at their meeting schedule and structure and they were able to eliminate some repeating meetings, which had a huge effect on um, the morale of their staff, um, mm -hmm. but also how to really build resilience through supervision um, and, and how to kind of create an organizational language um, that really looks at these wellness and resilience approaches. Mm -hmm. Todd, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, actually, actually, that was a great answer. I think uh, just rely on that. I, something I would add is, um, in addition to, to Anne's really good comments around resilience and, and just doing some intentional activities to, to create connection, is, is to sort of think through, um, particularly with, you know, individual therapy and, and televideo, you, you saw a pretty, pretty big acceptance rate there. And, and sort of think through um, the role of habit, you know, where, you know, if, if you ask counselors, you know, sort of the difference between what we're doing now and in person, yeah, there's some body language you can't quite see, but there's a lot of similarities. And, and so, so you did have a whole group that, and we're seeing this right now, you had a whole group that was like, there's no way video is ever going to replace in person. And then over time, they're like, ah, yeah, yeah, sort of getting used to this. And it becomes the new habit. And now we have this whole, whole reverse effect where it's like, hey, it's time to go in person. And then you have folks saying, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm sort of used to doing it this way. And, and so, and, and so I, I think, I think that's an opportunity actually is to say, well, what is it about in person that you liked more than video and vice versa? And, and then sort of get into some of these, you know, basics of how people create engagement, you know, how they, how they, 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 they get them, move them on to goals and objectives and, and, you know, to use motivational interviewing kind of language, change talk and, uh, and, and sort of use it as an opportunity to say, you know, how can we, you know, through what we've been through here, just become better at, at the craft and the 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 the, uh, the the clinical ish you know items that we do. So. Okay, thank you. Well, it sounds like there's some interest in learning if there will be any integration with peer services in the future. And asked in addition, text messaging and interactive chatting. Do either one of you want to field that question? Um, I'll I'll start. Okay. And I'll start. I think that's that's a great question, and and um, and it's it's something that it was it was uh, an initial omission in the, the 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 survey that we put together at least where we didn't have peer. I mean, we had case management issues in there, but that's not exactly the same, right? And and we didn't have peer issues, and and we in our second wave of the sur wave of the survey. Um, we did ask about peer issues and and uh, got really similar kind of data, but but I think that the 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 question is around what well, well, how does peer work into this? Does it things like that? Um, and I, I think that the first and short answer is absolutely yes. We we uh, another area we're doing research is is around a and then this is in, in addiction, um, uh, but I think there's some parallels here. Of, of the use of recovery apps and, and using using them, you know, for, for telephone and, and using those um, in conjunction with, um, you know, treatment and, and using them beyond or, you know, after treatment. And um, where we're getting the best use of the apps are in organizations where the peer recovery supports are are really working with those and frankly the peer recovery supports and the clinicians um, have have some interaction too and so 
I I see, yeah, I, I see that this is a great opportunity to to to, to continue the, the the whole trend towards having peer recovery more involved with uh, you know treatment and uh, and, and and addressing the, these chronic you know the, these chronic diseases, and so I, I think it's it's gonna it's going to continue to be an issue. I think as we're thinking about reimbursement, having, you know, reimbursement for that is, is really important. And um, I think there's, there's just, uh, this is just another way to provide peer recovery supports and to use those to help, you know, help with the, um, the, the other clinical services that are happening. Okay. And is there anything else you wanted to add to that? I'll just add briefly. So, um, Karen Fortuna presented, I think, yesterday um, uh, on, in, at this conference, um, and I know she has come out with um, some work around uh, peer-delivered telehealth, um, telebehavioral health. Um, I wasn't able to listen to her presentation, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I know this is an area of great interest, and as Todd said, really an area um, to continue to make peer services additionally available to people. So I think it's really a matter of how to do it well. Um, and I think um, the best thing for us to do is to look to the peer community and um, hear their voices, both in terms of what they want and it from peer providers, um, peer specialists, how they want to deliver it. Because the connection and the relationship there is so critically important. So trying to find a way to preserve that and 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 really utilize that in the um, remote telehealth world, I think is important to, to figure out how to preserve and to expand upon. Okay, thank you. Well, one critical issue obviously is reimbursement for telehealth services and how it compares to in-network services. You'll see, uh, Todd, there's a, a question directed to you. Can you speak more to the reimbursement issue and what can states do to ensure adequate reimbursement for providers and is payment parity between in-person and virtual services ideal? Your thoughts? <laughs> Some of that goes goes beyond my expertise, <laughs> but but I will say that you know the the notion of and and you I mean you had it real you laid it out really well in your slides, Robin, is that there was you know between telebehavioral health and in person there was parity there. And um, and and so I, I think to to continue to use data like we've had here, and um, it, it just to continue to make the case for it. I mean, I you know, and then beyond that, as far as you know, who to talk to and how. I mean, first of all, it's for you know, Ann and I, you know, being part of like SAMHSA grants. You know, we we can't do any lobbying or or what have you, but we can prevent. And present data like this and then you know for you know people who are making you know medi medicaid decisions you know pr private insurance decisions particularly medicaid it just you know i think just uh, the the continuing of it is important you know as, as i've as i've talked to some people in managed care you know there is a little bit of a concern well whoa we've had a, a bit of the wild west here and just anything you know things are happening on video that that aren't you know that wouldn't have been, been allowed you know in person and uh i i have a feeling that's more myth than reality you know as far as you know people not having adequate licensure and things like that and uh so i think that's another piece too is to say you know there has been, you know, good good practice practice here, and um, and and so I, I think I think I think that's a great question. I think it's one we need to keep asking, and I appreciate some of those decisions are being made as we speak right now. You know, as people are starting to appreciate that, you know, you know, as as with the vaccination rates go up and things like that, that you know they're. You know things are going to sort of you know return more to a state that that they were pre-COVID. And did you want to add anything to that question? Okay. Um, I'll just add that I think, as Todd mentioned, what's really critical, I think, and relates to billing is that we don't present this as an either or, but a you know a both and. And so I don't think all services can be 
provided remotely through telebehavioral health for everything as Todd's um, survey sort of suggests. And so I think in trying to, for those of you who are in a position to um, advocate for uh, ongoing reimbursement of telehealth and telephone services, because that's important in terms of accessibility, um, I think making it clear that there, the intention isn't to deliver everything remotely, but to deliver the things that can be developed, delivered well and that people want delivered remotely um, reimbur at, at reasonably reimbursable rates. Yeah, we see interesting patterns in our data in terms of utilization. Um, mental health really tracks closer to parity than some of the other medical services. And so the question, is it the chicken or the egg? Are there more services being rendered in the mental health setting because there's a sense of more equitable reimbursement? Or mm. is it just that they lend themselves more clinically to that type of intervention? Likewise, there is so many laws around the country that are impacting on telehealth that to some extent are being relaxed that will impact utilization. Some states have previously required the initial encounter to be in person with your provider before you can resort then to telehealth. Those are in some areas are really being eliminated or cross state lines. So it'll be interesting to see how both reimbursement questions and uh, you know, models as well as some of these laws are going to really impact not just mental health, but telehealth more broadly. I know we're coming up just at the bottom of the hour. We have probably time for one, maybe two questions. I see uh, there's a question asking, what video conferencing platforms do you use for treating your clients? Is there, I don't know if you want to be a commercial or <laughs> you, uh, there are, are a variety of ones that you're aware of. And um, there are a lot of different ones. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we actually asked that question, and uh, Zoom was the prominent one, but boy, I tell you, there was, uh, and, 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 and later on, Zoom initially, just the regular one, and then Zoom for healthcare, I think later on, people preferred more because of the, conf, you know, the, the, uh, the confidentiality features of it, but there was a pretty broad range, I, I think. I, I think it's one of those ones you, if, if you have one that you like, keep going with it. And then otherwise, if, if you're not sure, I, I, you know, sort of network with your peers, you know, and, and see what they're using and sort of their experiences, how much they're paying for it, things like that. Right. Okay. Well, maybe this last question lends itself to a quick, uh, a quick answer by each of you. The question is, will certified peer services become a reimbursable service in, in your estimation? Well, that's still a challenge, remote or not remote um, in some states. So I, I think that's, it's not an easy answer. Hope I ho certainly hope so. Um, Todd, anything? Yep, my, yeah, my, my two, my two one word answers is yes, and uh, hopefully soon. Okay. But, but we have a ways to go. But yeah, it's it's it, yeah. I think as the evidence keeps mounting, it, it's gonna it's gonna be there. But you know, new new services are always hard to bring in. I mean, and and so it's this sort of it's like the natural, you know, you know the you know the insurance companies don't want to pay more. But I I think it's 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 just a matter of time, and um, and hopefully it's sooner rather than later. Well, both of your surveys offered such rich information. Hopefully the audience will uh, read some of the materials uh, on it and, and delve a little bit more deeply. But thank you for sharing uh, what you have. Um, I know it sparked my further interest and it's been a pleasure uh, working with you both on this. And I wanna thank the audience for joining us today as well. Yep. Thanks so much. You as well, Robin, and I'll just, um, you know, just say, you know, certainly go to the uh, TTC websites uh, if you're interested in more information like this or technical assistance in these areas. It, uh, there's a whole variety of, of technical assistance is provided for free. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.